So I'll start just by reminding us all, this is a talk about property testing. Uh, just to recall the basic framework of property testing, this talk is gonna be all about property testing of Boolean functions, okay? So there's some n-bit function, takes n-bit strings, outputs single bits, and property testing is about the simplest kind of questions you could ask about a Boolean function. Does it have some property or not, right? Just a yes, no question. So the function that you're dealing with could be any Boolean function. This green oval is supposed to represent the space of all Boolean functions. And the collection of functions that have the property we identify with just a subset of you know, functions in that class. So what do we, what's the sort of way things work? We have query access to the function. We can submit inputs x and get back the value of the function on the input. We'd like to make a small number of queries, query the function on as few inputs as possible, and figure out if the function has the property we're interested in versus not having the property. Okay? So this is obviously impossible for any reasonable property. Is the, you know, is the function constant? Is the function balanced? Is the function you know, f of x equals x1 or something? You can never really tell, right? Maybe there's one single input, which is such that it screws, it screws you up from having the property. Um, so if you wanted to really answer this question, you can't hope to do so without basically querying the function on every input for almost any interesting property. So in property testing, what we do, of course, is we sort of relax things a little bit. We say, I only need to, well, Liam really likes to click, uh, lots of clicks on every slide, but um, yeah, so we're going to be sort of saying, uh, we give ourselves a promise. We say, I'll only have to worry about the case where either the function has the property or it's far from having the property. And we don't worry about sort of the intermediate regime where maybe the function is very close to having the property but doesn't quite have it. So just to recall the rules of the game again, we can think of the function, it's like a promise problem, right? We're given query access to a black, we're given black block access to an unknown function and we're promised that it either has the property or it's epsilon far for some distance parameter epsilon from having the property. And we should distinguish which of these two is the case with high probability, okay? And you know, if you get a function which is in the middle, you, anything you say is fine. We don't have to worry about inputs like that. So the standard uh, property testing setup. The property we'll be talking about for this whole um, work is that of being uh, monotone, the class of all monotone Boolean functions. But we're gonna be interested in telling whether our unknown function is monotone versus far from monotone. And this is a problem that's been studied a fair bit in um, property testing of Boolean functions. I think the first work on it was Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Ron Rubenfeld, almost certainly either Ron or Rubenfeld, I think Ron. Um, there was a Fox paper, then they subsequently improved the results in a journal version. There was sort of a stream of results up till just last year. Chakrabarty and Shashadri had a nice uh, advance, which I'll talk about a bit. But we still don't really know the answer to um, how many queries we need to solve a property testing for, mo for, monotone, for monotonicity. So we'll, we'll I'll talk uh, a bit about the, the sort of prior results on this, just set the stage before we get into um, the new results. So what is monotonicity? I don't think I've said that yet. Um, just to remind everybody, I think we all know this, but a monotone Boolean function is just one, we always mean monotone non-decreasing, right? So it has the property that if I have two comparable inputs, two bit strings x and y, such that coordinate wise x is less than or equal to y, then that means that f of x is less than or equal to f of y. Right, intuitively this just says that if I have an input and I flip some of the zeros in the input string to a one, that can't make the function change from one to a zero. Right, it's monotone non-decreasing. Uh, on the other hand, function being far from monotone, we just mean this in the standard sense of like Hamming distance, right? That, that had, in order to be epsilon far from monotone, what this means is that for every monotone Boolean function, our function f must disagree from that you know, monotone Boolean function on at least an epsilon fraction of the input, okay? So these are the two cases that we're trying to distinguish. Just, uh, I think Leon gave us a cartoon or two here to think about, um, sort of illustrate what monotone Boolean functions look like. So sometimes this is a handy picture to have in mind. You have this sort of Boolean hypercube with the all zeros input, the all ones input, and monotone functions have the ones up top and the zeros down below, right? Any way I walk up, I'll only pass from a, from a zero to a one. I'll never pass from a one to a zero if I'm walking upward. On the other hand, non-monotone functions or far from monotone functions, these are a little harder to visualize, but at least one cartoon picture you can have in mind is that they sort of have clumps of ones and zeros. I don't know if it's a bunch of one clouds floating in a sea of zeros or a bunch of zero clouds floating in a sea of ones, but right, there are places certainly where you could walk, from, walk upward from a one and get to a zero. Okay, so it's a far from monotone function. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit at the end of the talk about um, sort of a more precise characterization of far from monotone functions that'll be useful for us. So, okay, we'd like to test this property. We'd like to figure out whether our function is monotone or far from monotone, just to sort of recap um, what is known about this kind of thing. What's the first testing algorithm that you would think of if you were confronted with this problem? 
Well, you'd probably think of something like this, right? We know that for monotone functions, if I flip one bit from zero to one, that can only ever make the function go from maybe one to one, zero to zero, zero to one, but it can't ever cause the function to go from one to zero. Right, so a natural test that you might think of is pick a random edge from the Boolean hypercube. So these are two adjacent vertices that differ in just one coordinate. And uh, query these two vertices. So ask for f of x on f of x and f of y. And you'll see one of these four configurations, right? These are the only possibilities. And if you see one of these three, well, you can't really conclude whether the function is monotone or non-monotone. But certainly if this is what you see, then you know that the function is non-monotone. This is a violation of monotonicity, okay? So a very natural test is to do this. Pick a random edge in the hypercube and see if you get a violation of monotonicity. If, if monotonicity is violated, great. You know it's non-monotone, you can reject. On the other hand, if you get one of these three guys, what would you do? Well, try again. See if the next time you end up getting a violation of monotonicity. And you would think that you know if you uh, pass enough random checks of this form without violating monotonicity, probably the function is actually monotone. Certainly if you did this often enough that you queried every edge, and you'd see that <laughs> it's monotone. But it's natural to think maybe this is a better, better algorithm than that. And just a little bit of terminology, we'll call these violating edges for the duration of the test. Okay. So again, this is the uh, sort of very elementary tester that we just analyzed, right? Query a random edge, see if it's a violating edge, try this a bunch of times. Um, obviously, if the function is monotone, you'll never reject, right? So we're, we're, we're not gonna make mistakes the one way. Um, on the other hand, suppose the function is actually epsilon far from monotone. You know, in order to analyze this tester, we just need to know what can we say about the probability of finding a violating edge, okay? And it's not too hard to show, this is the main sort of structural result of this uh, first paper on monotonicity testing, that if your function is far from monotone, epsilon far from monotone, then you have at least an epsilon over n probability, at least an epsilon over n fraction of random edges will violate monotonicity. Okay, this is not a very difficult argument. It's based on sort of combinatorial shifting. Um, and it's also known that this is the best possible. You can't improve the analysis and do better. Just think of a function like, uh, an anti-dictator function, say f of x equals not x1, right? It's constant far from monotone, it's one half far from monotone, but only the edges in the direction coordinate x1 will reveal this violation of monotonicity. So there's no way to have a better analysis of this very simple tester. Um, and of course, given this, this tells us that we have a tester which works with n over epsilon queries. And it's very nice, it's one-sided, it's non-adaptive, it, it has all these nice properties, okay? So this sort of got the ball rolling in terms of we understood that we could do something about monotonicity testing. So in this first work of Goldreich et al, they introduced the problem and they gave this, uh, I think we call, we'll call this the edge tester. They gave this edge tester, which makes, we'll just think of epsilon as constant. It makes a linear number of queries uh, as a function of n, so it has O of n query complexity, okay? On the other hand, we'd like to know about lower bounds for this problem as well. So a couple of years later, I really don't know all these authors. I think it's a six author paper. Fisher, Lehman, maybe, Newman, Vaughn, Rubenfeld, Sam Rudnitsky. Something in, the, something in the Epsilon neighborhood of that set of authors um, gave the first lower bound and until, until this work, the only lower bound for monotonicity testing. So they were able to show that any non-adaptive tester for monotonicity has to make at least log n many queries. And consequently, that immediately tells us that any adaptive tester has to make log log n queries, right? This is the usual argument that I can sort of simulate uh, an adaptive algorithm by a non-adaptive algorithm just by trying simulating all possible answers that the, the algorithm might get. Um, and that costs us an exponential factor in the query, okay? So that was uh, what was known on the lower bound side. There was a bunch of work sort of over the years exploring different aspects of the question and closely related questions. But uh, the first advance on the upper bound side came quite recently. So I think this was last year's stock, uh, Chakrabarty and Shashadri came up with a clever, again, non-adaptive tester, which has a sublinear query complexity. So they ended up getting n to the seven eighths as a function of n, as, as a function of n, again, for constant epsilon. And their epsilon dependence, I should mention, is very good. I think it's n to the seven eighths over epsilon to the three halves or something. So it's very, it's very reasonable also as a function of epsilon. Um, okay, so this was the current state of the art. We had log n lower bounds for non-adaptive testers, and we had a non-adaptive tester with an n to the seven eighths upper bound. Okay, so that brings me to the results of the current work. Um, the first result is we have a significant improvement on the lower bound. So we can prove that any non-adaptive tester has to make at least essentially fifth root of n queries. So if it's a polynomial instead of logarithmic lower bound, 
And consequently, just again, the same trivial observation about going from non-adaptive to adaptive just tells us that any adaptive tester has to make log log n queries. So it's exponentially less embarrassing. Instead of log log n for adaptive, you can now say log n. Um, in terms of the upper bound, we have a polynomial improvement. So we can give a non-adaptive tester that instead of the n to the 7 8 upper bound of Chakrabarty and Shashadri, we, get, we make uh, n to the 5 6 and our dependence on epsilon is a little worse, epsilon to the fourth instead of epsilon to the two halves as the number of queries that we make. Um, so I should say, technically, the result up here and the result down here don't really have anything in common. I mean, one is an algorithm, one is, an algorithm, one is a lower bound. Um, we're getting an exponential improvement on the lower bound and only a polynomial improvement on the upper bound. <coughs> so for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to spend exponentially more time on the lower bound. Um, in fact, I don't have any slides on the upper bound at all. I can talk about it a little bit afterward if people want or just discuss it individually, but the, the talk will basically be about the lower bound. So what I hope to do is tell you about the main idea of the argument in a simpler setting. We'll give sort of a, tr a proof of a trivial version of the lower bound, but it has what I think of as all the main ideas for the upper bound. And then we'll see sort of the more technical um, aspects that give us the real upper bound. Uh, I'm revealing the curtain a little bit. A multi-dimensional central limit theorem turns out to play a key role. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about generalizing the lower bound. So Everything I've said so far is about testing uh, functions on the Boolean hypercube, where the input space is 0, 1 to the n, the Boolean cube. But you can extend this. People in property testing also look at, um, I guess, monotonicity and related properties on hypergrids, so where the domain is not just you know, 0, 1 to the n, but 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 up, up to n to the n. So we can extend our lower bound to uh, hypergrids as well. So I'll talk a little about that. Yeah, before I even. <laughs> Yeah. That's this Mike Patterson. Mike Patterson, very clever. Yeah. You're right. They are both. <laughs> they are both. <laughs> it's like a five. He needs. No, I don't think it. <laughs> I think. Yeah. I don't think it has anything to do with it. That's his thing where he can cut the six cube with five planes and then it, it punches up. Yeah, no, this is, this is I think, completely different. Um, if it turns out to be related, I'll buy you a drink. Yeah. Um, I'll buy you a drink anyways. Okay, so we're gonna be spending the rest of the, rest of the talk pretty much about the lower bound. Um, and I wish I could say, hey, I have a breakthrough new lower bound technique that lets us get this result, but that's not true. Um, the lower bound is attained using, you know, this sort of well-worn tool in property testing of Yao's min-max principle. So I think we're all familiar with this. The high-level idea is we'd like to prove a lower bound against randomized algorithms, property testing algorithms, of course, being randomized. Um, the way we do that, Yao's min-max principle tells us that it's enough if we can just hook up some clever distribution, some distribution over inputs, over functions, which is capable of tricking deterministic algorithms, okay? So... You know, thanks to Yao, we only have to worry about fooling any deterministic algorithm um, in, in order to get our lower bound. So what does Yao's principle say again in a little bit more detail? Again, we're concerned with this uh, property of testing monotonicity. So we're going to have to define two distributions, the way Yao's thing works. We need a distribution which I'll call DES, which is supported on yes instances, actual honest to goodness monotone functions. And we also need a distribution D no supported on no instances, functions which are epsilon far from monotone. So for the rest, for the whole lower bound part, please fix epsilon in your head to be 1 one hundredth, some fixed absolute constant, right? That's the sort of framework for our lower bounds. Um, and what do you need to do? You need to show that you have these two distributions. One is on yes functions, one is on far from yes functions, no functions. And you need to argue that they're indistinguishable. So for any deterministic algorithm, in other words, for any fixed, you know, set of query strings, that, which is what your deterministic algorithm does, uh, the two distributions basically fool the deterministic algorithm, right? The probability that your fixed deterministic algorithm outputs yes on a random yes function versus the probability your fixed algorithm on that same set of query strings, the same deterministic algorithm outputs no on a random function drawn from the no distribution should be small. I think this is a little bit of overkill. If this were 0.1, that would be fine too. That's enough indistinguishability to make the argument work, okay? The one thing I should mention, um, it's not actually imperative that the no functions, that this distribution D no be completely supported on, monotone, on far from monotone functions. If 99.9% .9 of the functions in this distribution are far from monotone, of course that implies the existence of another distribution completely supported on such functions, which is, which is what you need. 
What's that? That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have mentioned it otherwise. <laughs> but OK. So yeah, I also wish that I could say to you, hey, I have this fantastically clever like collection of new types of Boolean functions, which we use for this lower bound, which nobody's heard of before. But I'm afraid you probably have heard of these Boolean functions that we used for the lower bound before. They're just linear threshold functions. So these very simple and familiar types of Boolean functions. Um, they don't even have a threshold, right? So all of the functions, our yes functions, our no functions, are all going to be these functions of the form uh, f of x equals sine of w dot x. We don't even need a minus theta. Right, so they're these origin-centered linear threshold functions. I think I said this, yeah, I'll say it right up here, that we'll think of the Boolean hypercube for the rest of the talk as minus 1, 1 for the n. It just makes things a little bit cleaner and nicer, okay? So here's a picture of a linear threshold function. There's a hyperplane going through the origin, through the center of this minus 1, 1 cube, and points on one side are positive, blue, points on the other side are negative, yellow. So we, our two distributions are both distributions over LTFs, and they're even quite simple. Uh, in the first case, so let me talk about the yes distribution first. That's the green guy. A random yes function is obtained by setting each weight, each wi, independently. I'll call the random variable corresponding to the weight sigma i. So we independently choose weights plus 1 or plus 3, and that determines our yes function. It's supported, this yes family is supported on 2 to the n linear threshold functions. Each of them is equally likely. Okay, Our family of no functions, to choose a random uh, no LTF from our no distribution, we have just a different distribution over the weights. I'll call these, I think it's, uh, I think I lectured on this in a sublinear algorithms class I'm teaching. And there was a, a Greek student in the class who told me the correct pronunciation of this letter is nu. Can anybody? OK, I'll go with it. I, I've been saying it wrong <laughs> my entire life. But yeah, I don't think I'm pronouncing it correctly. But it was definitely more like ni than like nu, which is what I would say. So depending on your preference, this is either nu sub i or ni sub i. And it's just a slightly different distribution over the weights. It's minus 1 with probability 1 tenth, 7 thirds with probability 9 tenth. So this may look a little arbitrary, and it is quite arbitrary. We'll see at the bottom of the slide why we want this distribution. Um, OK, so I claim that this is going to work. Uh, what does that mean? Well, the first thing that had better be true is that the yes functions are indeed monotone Boolean functions. And that's immediate, right? I mean. They're LTFs with all positive weights for every possible outcome. So of course, they're monotone functions. And the second thing we need is that the no functions are far from monotone functions. And this gets back to this point that it's not the case that every function drawn from this no distribution is non-monotone. Right? There's an inverse exponential chance that all of your weights come out positive, in which case you know, that one function in the support actually is a monotone function. But with exponentially high probability, you get something like one-tenth of the end coordinates having negative weights, negative one. And it's very easy to argue then that um, as long as you get, say, 5% of all the weights being negative one, the function is actually constant far from monotone. That's just a routine calculation, um, which, which I'm not going to do. OK? So our yes functions are indeed monotone. Our no functions with extremely high probability are constant far from monotone. <coughs> That's what we want. And the interesting part is we have to argue the indistinguishability. We have to argue that any deterministic tester that makes at most n to the one fifth queries can't succeed. Is going to output uh, is going to accept yes functions with essentially the same probability as outputting no functions. This is the interesting part. And the key property that's going to enable us to do this, the key sort of uh, motivation for these choices of the yes and no distributions over these weights, is very simple. It's just that the first two moments of these distributions match. So if I look at a random sigma i, right? The expectation of that is obviously is obviously two. It's equally likely to be one or two, and a random new i. It's also the expectation is going to be uh, two, right? It's minus one with probability 0.1, seven thirds with probability 0.9. We can we can verify this. Similarly, the variance of these two random variables matches. I think they both have variance just one, right? Because this guy is always either one less than two or one more than two, and you can do the calculation for the other one that they have the right variance. So this is the key property to keep in mind. Um, for these random variables. OK. So I'll argue the indistinguishability for you um, in this talk. But I want to start with kind of a trivial version of it, or a very sort of small, um, almost insulting seeming version of it. This is what we ultimately want to show, that any deterministic tester that makes n to the 1 fifth queries has small distinguishing probability. But let me start by arguing that any deterministic tester that makes one query has very small distinguishing probability. Okay. So this is essentially a triviality. We could argue this in many different ways, but the particular way we'll argue it will be useful. It'll be extendable to the case of having more queries. Um, 
So again, we're trying to show that for any one query algorithm, that's an algorithm which you know, makes a single fixed query string, the probability that a random yes function uh, is accepted versus the probability a random no function is accepted, those probabilities are close. So what does the tester see in a situation like this? Well, it sees a single bit, right? I mean, it's got one query string. It sees the output of that query string. So in the yes case, the response that the tester sees to its query is just the sign of the sigma vector dotted with the input vector z. And in the no case, it's the sign of the random new vector dotted with the input vector z. So it just sees a single bit in both cases. Um, this, you know, thing that we're trying to achieve, the fact that these two probabilities are close to each other, that's, you know, this is of course just upper bounded by the variation distance between these two outputs that the function sees. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to argue that the variation distance between these two distributions on single bits is small. Um, and what is this single bit that the guy's going to see? Again, in this case, it's sine of this linear form, sigma dot z. So, right, when we, uh, Think of this random variable, sigma dot z. It's got some distribution. It's distributed on integers, as a matter of fact. The distribution maybe looks like this, and right, zero would be here. So this bit, this r sub yes bit, is either minus one or plus one. It's minus one if your draw from the distribution lies to the left of the origin, and it's plus one if the draw from the distribution lies to the right of the origin. Okay. Similarly, for the no distribution, right, there's some different distribution over the me dot z real valued vector, um, real valued random variable. And that's uh, drawn as sort of this red distribution. And again, we're going to see either a minus one if the draw from the red distribution is to the left of the origin or a plus one if it's to the right of the origin. Okay, and in both cases, I've drawn these distributions, the green distribution corresponding to this real random variable, the red distribution corresponding to this real random variable suggestively to look like Gaussians. And there's good reason for doing this because these random variables are a lot like Gaussians, right? They're sums of independent, very tame random variables. They're going to behave like Gaussians. And that's, that's what we're going to use. Okay. So now we're in the domain of talking about central limit theorems. Central limit theorems, of course, tell us exactly this. Sums of many independent, nicely behaved random variables act like Gaussians. They converge to Gaussians in various senses. And the Gaussians that they converge to are characterized, of course, by the mean and variance of these sums of independent random variables. So let me give you a sort of precise statement of um, the tool that we need to handle this Q equals one case. This is like the baby version because you're gonna need a higher dimensional version for the, for the general case. So this is the Sperry SAN central limit theorem. It says if you have these nicely behaved independent real valued random variables, and we'll have a very strong notion of being nicely behaved, which we can afford in our application, just that the, the uh, range of the random variable is absolutely bounded. They never deviate from their expectation by more than some tau. And in our setting, we achieve this. If tau equals two, it's three or something like that. Um, then the random variables, this is sort of a notion of CDF distance, the probability that the uh, sum of independent random variables is less than any fixed threshold versus the probability that the corresponding Gaussian with the same mean invariance is less than that threshold. You can upper bound it in terms of the variance of the overall thing and that bound on sort of the displacement that the random variables can take. Um, so just a picture of this sort of CDF distance. Um, I guess here the green thing denotes sort of the distribution of the uh, sum of independent random variables, right? In our case, it would be like some sort of discrete integer thing like this. And the uh, sort of curvy line, which you can see is like the CDF of the Gaussian. And the, uh, so the distance measure, this is sometimes called Kolmogorov distance or CDF distance. It just corresponds to sort of the maximal height between these two, um, between these two CDFs at any, at any point in the domain. Okay, so that's what the Sperry SAN central limit theorem gives us. So we want to upper bound, again, the uh, variation distance between these bit-valued random variables. And remember, the first bit-valued random variable is the probability that our draw lies here. The second bit-valued random variable in the no case is the probability that our draw lies here. Same place, and same you know, threshold in both cases, which is zero. So the Sperry SAN central limit theorem is exactly the tool that we want, right? It tells us that in the yes case, we converge to some Gaussian. In the no case, the real valued random variable again converges to some Gaussian. And the way we set things up, we make sure that it's the same Gaussian. We have the same mean, the same variance for each of these random variables. So if for media, you can just see that we're gonna get the same um, mean and variance for the sums. The you know, we're sort of uh, taking the inner product with the same vector z in both cases. So consequently, these two Gaussians are going to be the same Gaussian. Hence these two random variables, the uh, yes variable and the no variable, or this, you know, this Booleanized version where we look at the threshold, are going to be close to each other because they're both close to 
threshold in the same direction as it. Okay? So I think that was essentially an actual proof of the main result for one query, right? We saw that if you have a deterministic tester that makes one query, then we get that the difference between these acceptance probabilities is extremely small. Maybe just to recall where the square root n comes from, um, right in this very essay and setting, what is our bound? It's, you know, that sort of bound on the deviation of the random variables, how, how wide is the range that they can take, divided by the overall variance. And this overall variance, this is the sum of n independent random variables, each of them is variance one, we get square root of n in the denominator. So we have constant over square root of n. So that's where that bound came from. Okay, so this is really overkill. Remember, something like 0 0.1 would have been fine to have on the right-hand side here. We achieved something much, much stronger. So it seems like you know there's potentially room to exploit this, this length that we have, and that's, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so now let's go to the real thing. We're interested in the case where we get to make two queries instead of just one query. And it turns out that the right tool that we want, uh, that we need to use for this job is a uh, higher dimensional generalization of the Barry SAM theorem, okay? So these are referred to sometimes as multi-dimensional central limit theorems. Now instead of summing up independent real valued random variables, we're summing independent vector valued random variables, okay? But the message of these theorems is the same. If you sum many independent sort of nice or reasonable higher dimensional random variables, they're going to converge to some higher dimensional Gaussian. And again, the mean and the variance of the Gaussian they converge to will be determined by the mean and variance um, of the original thing. This should probably be covariance. We'll see, of course, we need covariance um, in order to really characterize the higher dimensional Gaussian. Um, this is a fuzzier statement, though, than in the original setting, right? If we're in a higher dimensional space, you have to be a little bit more maybe precise about what do you mean by converge? What kind of closeness are we talking about here? So we'll get to that. First, some uh, nice pictures of the, the giants whose shoulders we're standing on, though. Um, so there are a bunch of multidimensional central limit theorems that have come up in the literature sort of of our community over the last couple of years. Um, you can use a multidimensional CLT that was kind of implicit in the work of Mossel and was elaborated on, uh, really worked out in this, this subsequent paper of uh, Pariksha, Ryan, Yi, and uh, David Zuckerman. And if you use that multidimensional CLT, you end up with something like an n to the 1 12th lower bound in our, in our setting. However, it turns out that if you use a CLT due to Paul and Greg or Greg and Paul Valiant instead, uh, which is a CLT telling you but you, that you get closeness in terms of this e earth mover distance between two uh, higher dimensional distributions, then you can get a better bound, which is the bound that we finally end up with of n to the 1 12th. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about how this works and how we, how we get there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the metric here is for like test functions with bounded third derivative or, yeah. It's a different flavor of CLT, what these guys prove versus what these guys prove. I'll give a precise statement of what these guys prove, but I won't give you a precise statement of this because we're not, we're not gonna end up using it, yeah. We tried, to, we tried to use this and see if we could do something better and it seemed like kind of the fantasy version of this theorem, the best thing it could give us was n to the 1 fifth and then we realized we could get that with, with this CLT. Okay, okay, so we're gonna embark now and actually do the real result. We're gonna show that for any query, any uh, tester deterministic algorithm that makes at most n to the one fifth queries, we get this bounded variation distance between the vectors of this function, okay? Okay, so there's just a little bit of setup to sort of be clear on what we're doing. Our tester makes some deterministic set of queries. It makes Q queries. We're gonna think of those queries as being uh, arranged sort of row by row in a matrix. So we have a Q by N matrix. All the entries of the matrix are minus one ones, just because each query string is a minus one one bit string. Um, and so, you know, the ith row, q sub i is the ith query string that the deterministic algorithm makes. And what does our tester want to do? It wants to figure out whether um, the vector of q bits responses that it gets came from a random yes function versus coming from a random no function, okay? So just to set this up again and be very clear about what the testing algorithm gets, um, Right, it sort of submits this matrix of queries, these Q query strings. And uh, in the case where it's a random yes function, there's a, you know, an instantiation of this random variable, the sigma, the, the plus ones and plus threes. And that determines some qubit string, sorry, some uh, Q dimensional vector in Rn, right, which is this vector of inner products that you get on the Q query strings. Um, so there's some Q dimensional vector in our, sorry, some Q dimensional vector in our Q. That come that a random variable in our Q that comes from a random yes, fu a random yes uh, function, a random yes vector, 
there's a few dimensional uh, random variable that comes from a random no vector, but the tester doesn't, of course, get to see these two dimensional real valued random variables. The tester gets to see plus minus one outputs. It gets to see bits, right? So what it, the tester gets to see, sort of the, the response that's given to the tester in the yes case is the sign, the coordinate wise sign of this q dimensional vector, right? It gets to see, was it positive or negative? Was it positive or negative for each of the q coordinates of this real valued random variable? And likewise in the no case. Right, the tester just gets to see the output of the LTS, doesn't get to see the thing that's fed into the sign function itself. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to upper bound the variation distance between this guy and this guy. We want to upper bound the variation distance between um, the signs of these, the coordinate wise signs of these, these Q dimensional real random variables. So for me, at least, a picture in this case is nice to sort of really illustrate what's going on. Um, you can think about like in the one dimensional case, right, it was like we had this Gaussian, which went up and down, and we got to see whether it was on this side or this side. In the two dimensional case, or I guess the picture is a three dimensional case, you get to see three bits, you get to see which orthant the three query string, the, you know, two dot, the two sigma three query string collides in, right? So what the testing algorithm is given, it's, it, the response that it gets to its queries is it's told an orthant of RQ, right? It gets to see, first coordinate was positive or negative, the second coordinate was positive or negative, so on and so forth. It gets this in both cases. So we're dealing with random variables here. These, you know, responses to Q query strings are random variables with two to the Q possibilities, possible outputs, okay? So what do we want to do? We want to upper bound the variation distance between these random variables. Um, this is like a sum over all Q to the Q possible orthants of the probability that the yes guy is in that orthant versus the probability the no guy is in that orthant. Okay? So a naive thing to do would be to do some kind of union bound of this, you know, one dimensional sort of standard Barry SAM, but that would be bad. We'd be paying some kind of exponential and Q penalty here and we wouldn't get better than a logarithmic lower bound. Okay? Instead we want to sort of use um, more advanced machinery, we want to use a real, honest to goodness, high dimensional um, central limit theorem, which hopefully will let us escape this exponential dependence on Q, and indeed it does. So it's convenient to rephrase this variation distance bound as being just the maximum, right? We take sort of the worst union of orthants. This is just the standard sort of alternate view of uh, L1 distance or variation distance. We want to say over the worst possible union of orthants, what's the biggest the difference in probabilities can be that we land in the one union of orthants versus the other union of orthants. Okay, so we need a CLT. Uh, sorry? Exactly, yeah. So it's for the worst choice of a union of orthants, what's the probability in the first case you land in that union versus the probability in the second case you land in that same union of orthants? Exactly. Okay. Um, I don't know what Liang's getting at with these slides. Uh, okay, yeah. So we can rephrase this just to make it sort of crystal clear as to how we're going to apply a uh, high dimensional central limit theorem, right? We have our query vector. We have uh, the response vector, which is the sign of this guy. You know, just looking at it, what is this? It's a sum over the columns, over n different columns of the column times the corresponding bit. The column times the corresponding, you know, random, random variable from the product distribution. So that's in the yes case. We have a sum of these vector valued independent random variables, okay? In the no case, we have the same thing going on. We just have a different uh, distribution. So in both cases, we're getting exactly the sort of thing we would want to apply a central limit theorem, a high dimensional central limit theorem. Um, you know, and we can sort of feel like, hey, this should work out, right? It's a trivial calculation that again, just since the means and the variances of the individual coordinates match up, you can trivially verify that the means of the vector valued random variables, it's the same Q. That's the thing which makes it work, right? It's the same Q. So the vector valued random variables also have the same means and the same covariance matrices. Okay, so we should expect that if they both converge to a Gaussian, they're gonna converge to the same Gaussian and hence be close to each other. Okay, and India looks skeptical, but I can, I'll, I'll give you a copy of the paper. <laughs> you can check the calculation. <laughs> um, okay, so this is what we want. We need some kind of CLT which sort of says for us in a rigorous way, hey, if you sum up n nice independent vector valued random variables, okay, and the sums, the two sums have matching means, matching covariances, they're close in some kind of sense. 
So how do we get that? Well, again, you can get that in different ways. It's going to be best for us to get this from the uh, central limit theorem, the source neighbor central limit theorem of Dragon Claw Valley. And uh, that's what every central Dragon Claw is based on, right? Are they identically distributed? They're not identically distributed, right? Remember, the, um, the only randomness here comes from plus 1 versus plus 3 for sigma i. And the only randomness here comes from minus 1 versus positive 7 thirds for mu i, right? But the means match, the covariances match, so, yeah. No, not necessarily, right? I mean, Q1 is just the, the first coordinates of the Q query string. They are what they are. I don't know what they are. I can't control what they are. They're independent because sigma 1 is independent from sigma 2. Yeah. So again, like think of it as like your enemy gets to pick the query matrix. Your enemy gets to fix the Q, right? So there's, there's certainly not, there's no randomness over the Q, right? This is some bit string of length Q, Q2, Q star 2 is some other bit string of length Q. I don't have control over that, right? But the randomness, this is independent randomness between sigma 1 and sigma 2. So it's like an adversarially chosen vector Q star 1, but then it's randomized with sigma 1. And then there's another adversarially chosen vector Q star 2, and it's independently randomized with sigma 2, and we sum up those things. So Q star i, sigma i is a real value, is a, I mean, it's a, it's a random bit vector. It, it's not a bit, sorry, sigma <laughs> should be plus, plus 1, plus 3. Q star i, sigma i is a random vector in RQ, which is independent across different i's. Yes, yes. So it's stronger, it's stronger, and maybe this is what you're asking, it's stronger than sort of just saying, hey, this, this random variable, the sum of these guys, has matching means and covariances. Actually, each individual sum and, right, the seventh guy in this sum, that vector has the same mean as the seventh guy in this sum. It has the same covariances. This yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah. that seems uh, to me like it's just a lazy way to do it. Um, the vector that, uh, the vector values are only the same as one, are like really nice. They can only go to Yeah, they're quite, they're quite nice. Every, co every coordinate is plus minus one, plus minus three in this case. Every coordinate here is plus minus one, plus minus seven thirds in this case, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have a lot, I mean, you have a lot of control. You probably have all figured out there's nothing really special about minus one and seven thirds, <laughs> right? You could have almost, you, you could have really whatever kind of distribution you want as long as these conditions are satisfied. What's, what's crucial is that you have actually support on some negative numbers, so you get the non-monotonicity and support on some positive numbers. And you need support on some positive numbers so that it'll match the means of the, right? But there's a lot of latitude in terms of what you do with this construction. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so we need a CLP, right, to tell us that these, these nicely behaved random vector valued random variables, which morally should be close to each other, are close. Um, yeah, what do we need? We need, a, we need a CLP, which tells us what we know in our hearts should be true is in fact true, right? That these sums of independent random variables are each close to the corresponding multidimensional Gaussian, because then they'll have to be close to each other, okay? And we need that closeness with respect to union of orthants. Um, so Greg and Paul Valiant have this great multidimensional CLP, which tells us that a sum of many nice, you know, vector-valued random variables converges, is close to the corresponding Gaussian with the right mean, and this should again be covariance. And their CLP works with respect to the Wasserstein distance or the earth neighbor distance, okay? There's no randomness in the choice of the matrix Q. Oh, linearly independent. No, no, no. It's just a query matrix. It's whatever queries yeah, people gave us. Yeah. Yeah. It might be degenerate Gaussian. Yeah. That's possible. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. So that's a nice thing about this CLP of Greg and Paul's. If you think about it, for earth mover distance, it should be able to handle that. Right, because if, if I have sort of like a degenerate matrix where it's all really living in some lower dimensional space, that's not gonna affect the earth mover distance, right? Because it, it's, it, it, yeah, it, it's, I, I like the CLP, right? It doesn't sort of have a dependence on the smallest singular value or something like that, like, like you would see maybe for other metrics. Um, yeah, so just to remind people, what is this earth mover distance between two distributions, or distributions in this case just over RQ? It's the minimum amount of work you need to do. Think of the, you know, it takes you one unit of work to move, you know, one unit of mass, a distance of one. So you have these two distributions. I need to change the Q 
PDF of the first guy into the PDF of the second guy. What's the optimal scheme for moving the mass and doing that at the smallest possible cost in work? That's the earth meter distance between these two distributions. Can I ask a question for this? So can you go back to that slide and repeat what the program is? Sure, yeah. What is the program in case number two? How are the programs in case number one? Uh, this is a... I so is that what a parental group is getting a stronger metric from? Like in so the, the I guess the, the vector, the, the matrix Q could be arbitrary, right? And my, my algorithm could ask the same query five times. Of course, you could simplify in that case. But maybe the matrix Q, he asks a bunch of queries which are very, very close to each other. There's only a tiny difference between these things. So... It probably means he threw away a query or two. Yeah, he shouldn't have. Yeah. You're saying it shouldn't be a problem. You're, you're saying this. You're saying there's potential for an improvement based on the fact that if it, if it is singular, close to singular, it seems like it should only help you. The way I think of it is, yeah, if the matrix really has lower rank, then he, he didn't really make as many queries as he could have made. He made... And slightly hard to prove fast. Yeah. Like even if it becomes out in those kind of cases, like it's not immediately, you cannot say that this was right. the right out. Mm. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this seemed, this seemed like the quantitative, I, I, I'm not going to pretend, A, that I'm an expert on these multidimensional CLTs, or B, that we sort of scoured the literature on these multidimensional CLTs. You might notice something about these two multidimensional CLTs I threw up there. They come from our community, <laughs> right? These are the results that I'm, I'm familiar with. So it's possible that, uh, I think it, yeah, it certainly is quite possible that you can prove stronger results at the, at, at, with, with, more, with more advanced technology. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't, I'm not claiming this is optimal. Um, Okay, right. Yeah, I feel like it. <laughs> I'm trying to use transitivity of work here in some sense. <laughs> yeah, that I think these. Yeah, we we can talk about we can talk about later what what might or might not be possible. Um, okay, so anyway, they weren't you know these guys did search the literature, but they weren't nice enough to prove exactly the result we wanted. That you know the the probability on a union of orthants has to correspond in these two cases. So we did have to do a little bit of work. Um, Arguing that closeness in this earth mover distance means that we can get that you have essentially the same amount of mass in any union of orthants, and that's a uh, distance. No, no, no. I'm moving mass on. I'm moving mass of the real valued random variables, and that the when I say that I need it, I need. I look at the mass on a fixed union of orthants. That's that corresponds to like the. Yeah, the, the, their CL, I mean, their earth mover distance is f with respect to L2. Yeah, Euclidean distance. What the Hamming distance comes from the fact that we're, we're talking about the mass on a union of orthants. So just like our test functions are like unions of orthants. Um, yeah, so let me just state their CLT, and then we'll see, we'll see that the work we have to do to get a bound for unions of orthants is not difficult at all. Their CLT tells us that, again, you have these, uh, they have an absolute bound on the L2 deviation that each random variable takes from its expectation. Okay, that each random variable is sort of within a ball of radius tau around its expectation. Um, you have the two-dimensional Gaussian, which matches the mean and covariance of the sum of independent random vectors. Then the earth mover distance between the guy you started with and the two-dimensional Gaussian has this bound, tau times q, the dimension, times log n. And they conjectured that this log n can be gotten rid of. Even if you got rid of it, it would just affect the, the tilde and our bounds, the log n, the log factors and our bounds. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to argue that having tau, uh, for them it's the Euclidean distance, like it's the, the, the radius of the ball around which your vector-valued random variable is supported. This is, I'm just restating, I'm just, yeah, I'll get, I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah, we take, we take that into account. Um, so we need to argue that given small earth mover distance, okay, that gives a small union of orthant distance. Okay, and I'll use this cartoon for a union of orthants, the first and the third orthant. 
so we'll see we'll see in our setting how it comes out yeah it does it does it does grow with q and that's one of the reasons we get n to the one fifth instead of something like n to the one third yeah so just to sketch how this argument goes it's a simple argument um, so think about the contrapositive suppose that the uh, sum of independent vectors you know versus the corresponding gaussian actually puts significantly different weight on these two unions of orthants so the Sum of independent vectors puts weight 0 0.3 on these two orthants, but the Gaussian puts weight only 0 0.2 on these two orthants. Okay? I want to contrapositively argue that this means the earth mover distance has to be kind of large. Well, okay, if I want to sort of change this uh, S distribution into the G distribution, obviously I have to move 0.1 amount of mass out of this union of two orthants, move it into the other orthants somehow. So that feels good. That feels like I have to do a bunch of earth moverish kind of work, right? Work is moving mass certain distance but you know what if I some what if somehow all the mass of these all of the 0 0.1 that I have to move was really really close to the boundaries of these orthants and I just nudged it a tiny tiny little bit I'm moving a lot of mass but I'm moving at a very tiny distance right so I don't immediately get that the earth mover distance is large but I mean what would happen if somehow there was 0 0.1 mass over here and over here and I could just nudge it a tiny tiny little bit and get it to go outside the union of orthants that would mean that after I moved it in the Gaussian distribution that I end up with, the Gaussian has a lot of weight on this boundary close to the union of orthants. And Gaussians can't do this kind of thing. Right? We have anti-concentration for Gaussians, so that's, that's not going to happen. This is the high-level idea. Um, I don't think there's a lot much more detail on the uh, slightly more detailed slide, but just a kind of a picture, you can say that I have some radius boundary. This is like a parameter that we'll put, we'll get, um, we'll put into the final theorem statement. So I need to move a delta amount of mass, say, from my uh, sum of independent random variables out of the blue region, okay? So some of it maybe ends up in the red region, some of it ends up in the boundary. That's like the near part, and some of it ends up um, outside the boundary. It moves a further distance. We can bound each of these quantities, right? The amount that ends up in the near region, well, that all ends, that, that's all mass that the Gaussian must be putting on the orthant boundary, and so intuitively this is gonna be small by some kind of anti-concentration for Gaussians. And the amount that moves far, that moves past the orthant boundary, it's moving a distance of at least r, right? So we know that the earth mover distance has to be at least r times the amount of mass that's moved this far distance, okay? So, you know, we get a bound of the, of the type that we want then. Um, and just trading these two things off, this gives us, this gives us the kind of statement that we need. Um, right, we can say that the, uh, the difference in these probabilities is upper bounded by sort of the contribution from the uh, far part is this earth mover over R and the contribution from the near part is this Gaussian anti-concentration. Um, and again, we have a bound on this from the valiant valiant CLT, which tells us that the earth mover distance is small. We have a bound on this just by Gaussian anti-concentration. And I think, uh, yeah, so here's a tiny bit more detail. If you want um, kind of a statement of how things work out in our particular setting, what do we have? We have that coordinate wise, right? For each coordinate of each of these sum ands, these random vectors that we're summing, the deviation in each coordinate is at most tau. So this is like in, this is like the Q feeding into the tau. We have a coordinate-wise bound of tau, and that means something like a tau times Q in the in the up in the uh, the real bound. Um, so our final statement is what? Our final statement is that uh, this probability difference on unions of orthants, we can upper bound it by uh, those guys had tau Q. We get tau Q to the three halves because we're going in two dimensions. We have a bound of tau in each coordinate. We get an extra squares of Q. Um, and on the other hand, right, for the other term, we have an expression which looks like this. And if you look at, think about this, um, what, are these, what is this denominator going to look like in our setting? Uh, you know, the, these xij's, these are just random variables like plus one, plus three, or minus one, minus three, or minus one, uh, plus seven thirds, or plus one, minus seven thirds kind of thing, right? These are very, very well behaved because of the framework that we're dealing with where we, we know what this Q matrix is. It's a very twin kind of thing. We know what these sigmas are. So we understand that we understand these things very nicely, and we um, we know that the, the uh, this variance term that we get in the denominator is exactly the square root of n actually in our setting. So you just trade things off. Um, a little bit of the gory details, uh, assuming we worked it out correctly, which I think we did. We choose r so as to optimize these two quantities. You end up with something like q to the five fourths over n to the one fourth, and this means that you can get away with n to the one fifth squares and still have it being small. So I pretty much am out of time. I could say a word or two about the, uh, the hypergrid. There's at least a glorious picture of a hypergrid, um, which I should show you. Yeah, so 
hypergrid domains. I don't think that Li Yang, my student, drew this himself. I'm almost sure that this is uh, this, this came from the internet <laughs> somewhere. Um, anyway, I'll just at least state what's going on here. So people in property testing look at these kinds of problems as well. You have a Boolean function not over the Boolean hyper Q, but over a hyper grid. The domain now is just that each coordinate can take values between, say, 1 and n. But it's still a Boolean valued function. And it's very natural to say, I still want to understand when is a function like this monotone versus far from monotone. So almost nothing changes. The only thing that changes in the setup is that our domain changes. We now have the domain is the hypergrid. Monotonicity, it's obvious still what monotonicity means in a setting like this. Um, and we still want to solve this problem. So the best upper bounds, there's no analog of the Chakrabarti Shashadri thing known for hypergrids. The best upper bounds are just linear in the dimension, uh, basically O of n. And prior to our work, I don't think anybody really had a lower bound for the case of Boolean valued functions on hypergrids. There was this Blade Brody Matlib paper where they gave a lower bound of, I think, the min of n and the size of the range squared. So it was just like a constant lower bound, essentially, because the range here for Boolean functions is 0, 1. But it turns out that our lower bound extends with almost no work. Um, we get the same n to the 1 fifth, no matter what n is. There's an asterisk, though, and the asterisk is that it, it only works for even n. I think you can get around this, but at least the simple argument I'll show you now just works for even n. And uh, can I go for th three more minutes? Okay, okay, it's, it's, it's short. I don't, I don't think I'll need 10, but um, okay. So the, the tool which we're going to use, it's just a reduction. We reduce the, the, the hypergrid case to the Boolean case. And the key tool in this reduction is this very nice result of Fisher et al. for a kind of general process. It doesn't even need to be the hypergrid here, but just specialized for the hypergrid. These guys have an if and only if characterization of functions that are far from monotone. So our, say, hypergrid function is far from monotone if and only if there are epsilon times the size of the domain, in this case, epsilon times n to the n, many different pairs of inputs. These are not like edges in the Boolean hypercube. Think of these as like increasing paths in the Boolean hypercube. So each xi, yi is a comparable pair. xi is some point down here. yi is some point up here above it in the hypercube, which violate monotonicity. Okay? So being epsilon far from monotone means that right, we have epsilon 2 to the n, many pairs like this. Okay, where we have violations of monotonicity along those pairs. So this. Oh, you could have a, uh, n, n to the n over two, half n to the n. There are n to the n points in the domain, and you could match. You could match everything up. There's m. It's one through m in each dimension. There are n dimensions, so there are n to the n points. Each pair has two points, so that's half n to the n pairs. Okay. okay. So yeah, we'll call these violating pairs. Um, and I'll just point out that one of these two directions is trivial. Suppose I say to you, hey, I have this many violating pairs. I have epsilon m to the n violating pairs, all these violating pairs. Well, how close can I be to a monotone function? If I'm, you know, in order to take a function like this and make it a monotone function, I'd better for each pair, either change the one or change the zero. If I don't change one of those two guys, it's not going to be monotone. So I'd better change, if I have epsilon m to the n many violating pairs, I'd better change at least epsilon m to the n many inputs. Right? So if you have these violating pairs, you certainly are far from monotone. And the other direction is not too hard. You can prove it with Hall's theorem. Um, but it's an if and only if kind of statement. Okay. Yes? Uh, so a pair to a monotone one, which, so you're talking about like now a setting where you're given as input like the entire, say, say we're on the Boolean cube. So I, you give me the entire truth table. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. So you're interested in like two to the O of n time algorithm, given the truth table of a Boolean function. Yeah. So you're saying, right. Yeah. If you had it, um, I don't think so. 
idea. No, I don't. It's a good. It's a good question. I don't know of any algorithmic work where people, sort of the exact opposite of this property testing flavor of stuff. Where you say, oh, I only get a few queries. You're saying like, you know, I, I happily take the entire truth table as the input, and I'm willing to. I want to see what I can do in that point in time. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So just the idea of the reduction. Um, how does it work? So we're going to say if I have an arbitrary Boolean function on the hypercube, okay, I can define for you a function on the hypergrid in the obvious way. The hypergrid function, right, its inputs are these numbers between 1 and n. I just, you know, convert it to a Boolean. I come up with the hypergrid function by taking the Boolean function on inputs from 1 through m and doing the obvious thing. Threshold each of them, according to whether it's in the first half or the second half. Now I have an n bit string. I can feed that into my Boolean function, and I've determined a value for my function over the hypergrid. Okay? So it's pretty obvious that if the Boolean function is monotone, then so is the hypergrid function, right? I mean, increasing one of the uh, xi's from m over 3 to 2m over 3, or from m over, m over 3 to 2m over 5, or whatever, it obviously can't make the, make the function flip in the wrong direction. What's a little bit non-trivial, but it's also quite easy, is to argue the other direction. That if the Boolean function is far from monotone, then so is the hypergrid function. And if we have this, right, if we can argue this direction, then obviously the lower bound for the Boolean function testing problem gives us a lower bound for the hypergrid problem. We couldn't have a better algorithm for the hypergrid, or we could have used it to solve the Boolean. Okay? So this is what we need to argue, right? And we're going to use this characterization in both directions, but in the two different functions. So we know from the uh, characterization that the Boolean function being far from monotone corresponds to the existence of these disjoint pairs. Okay? And on the other hand, if we want to argue that the hypergrid function is far from monotone, right, that's the same thing as arguing that we have these disjoint pairs. We need epsilon n to the n, sizable domain of n to the n many pairs. So what we need to do is just get from here to here. We need to show that if our Boolean function has these epsilon 2 to the n disjoint pairs in the Boolean cube, then we can get epsilon m to the n disjoint comparable pairs in the hypergrid setting. And um, it's not hard to do. I mean, you just look at the numbers involved and you say, hey, I'd better have a way of taking a single violating pair, an xy in the Boolean cube, and converting it into m over 2 to the n many violating pairs in the hypergrid. So the, you know, the approach suggests itself immediately, right? I've got some violating pair in the cube. I need to map it to a cloud of points in the hypergrid, another cloud of points in the hypergrid. Um, it's just the obvious mapping that you would think of, right? Coordinate-wise, I have a bunch of zeros and ones for my x, x1 through xn. I'll just convert it into the product of the corresponding first half, second half kinds of things in the hypergrid domain. Um, so it's obvious that these sets I get out, right? If I have a single n-bit string x, then I have m over 2 times m over 2 n times. I get a m over 2 to the n, you know, sized cube of points in the hypergrid setting. And it's very, very easy to you know, convince yourself that there's this nice bijection, which takes me from, you know, the structure of this is just some cube, the same cube. It's just, this is not, this is hand waving, I think, by definition, what I'm doing, but it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's very, very easy. Um, okay, so that's, that's it. Uh, so what did we do? We saw this lower bound. We um, now sort of know, at least, that for non adaptive testers, monotonicity testing, the right answer is somewhere in this polynomial regime between n to the 1 fifth and n to the 5 sixths. I'm virtually sure the right answer is neither n to the 1 fifth nor n to the 5 sixths, um, but it's, it's somewhere in there, at least it's polynomial. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to try to come up with polynomial lower bounds against adaptive testers. And if I weren't being recorded, I would state for the record that I don't think there are polynomial lower bounds against adaptive testers. Um, since I'm being recorded, I'm not going to say that. But who knows? It's, it's really possible that that the right answer, if you get adaptivity, you can do a lot of things. You can do binary search. You can sort of sneak up on your favorite corner of the hypercube. I think it's conceivable that adaptive testers can work with poly log n queries for monotonicity. Yeah, it's very easy to argue that for our functions with something like log n queries, you, you just use binary search to home in on the boundary, and you look at what's happening in the boundary, and you can quickly tell, oh, you know, there's a, there's a single variable here, which seems to count for as much as seven thirds of, a, of these other kinds, of, it, it's easy to distinguish those two. Yeah. Um, okay. What I didn't talk about is the other the other portion of the work, which is this upper bound. Um, this we get into the five sixths instead of into the seven eighths. Just I guess two lines on it. Uh, we build heavily on 
ingredients in the Chakrabarti Shashadri paper. So Chakrabarti and Shashadri, uh, they have sort of a two-pronged test there, right? If your, your far from monotone function has many violating edges, then it's okay to just use the edge test there and it'll be efficient. If it doesn't have so many violating edges, they prove this nice structure theorem, which says it has to have some other useful structure, a large matching of uh, disjoint violating edges. And uh, you know, based on the existence of this large matching, disjoint matching of violating edges, they are able to come up with a different test there, which queries points on a path and finds a violation. So we have a different, um, a different algorithm, a different way to query points on a path, uh, which gives us a better, a better analysis and a tighter bound in that case. So it's the same kind of trade-off, but we're just we're able to tighten the screws on one of one of the sides of what they do. Um, and here, you know, our tester, the Chakrabarti Shashadri tester, the uh, original edge tester, all of these things are non-adaptive. All these things only make one-sided error. I think it's interesting again to think about whether adaptive algorithms, maybe which make two-sided error, could could be more efficient for monotonicity testing. Um, so there's, I think, still a lot to figure out. Okay, that's it. Thanks.